Welcome to Take Your Life Back. My name is Ralph Friedrichs and I just want to welcome everyone to another segment, Take Your Life Back. We're going to discuss uh, a really important issue and one that I'm quite familiar with and that is a secret slash closet drinker. Uh, I'm not sure how many people have uh, actually met people like that, uh, but if you've been watching your videotapes, I used to be a closet drinker and I'm quite familiar of, of the signs, I'm quite familiar of how to get away with it, uh, but I can guarantee you this, that the people uh, that knew me, uh, that were with me 24-7, 24-7, knew what I was doing. Let me read to you exactly what the Mayo Clinic calls a closet drinker. A closet alcoholic is one who hides his drinking habit by doing it in private, hence the word closet. Even though closet alcoholics take great measure not to get caught, there are several telltale signs that give them away. Here are some of the signs. When they drink to get intoxicated or forget their problems, they want to just become numb. That is a sign of a closet drinker. Hide alcohol in unlikely places. It could be anywhere and we're going to go through some of those prefer to drink alone or in secret because they don't want other people to know that they depend on their alcohol. Problems have arisen at work or at home or at school and the legal system because of alcohol. Those are all signs of a closet drinker. Frequently experience memory loss or blackouts. I've had them. I've had memory losses. I've had the blackouts. Uh, it's things I don't miss anymore, uh, but that is a sure sign. Inconsistencies, mild dishonesties, white lies to make up any story to cover up their own alcohol uh, dependency, to, to hide that they're drinking 24-7 probably. A closet drinker drinks morning, night, it doesn't matter what time seems overly anxious. We discussed this in a previous uh, video. A person that's very anxious and antsy and wants to always go running out and doing things, that is a person that's intoxicated probably most of the time. Empties bottles in workplace areas. Uh, when I say empties bottles, not empties in this way because he does empty it into himself, but what he does is that um, uh, before he hides them in drawers or uh, in the dumpster, he does empty him, uh, but it's uh, emptying usually uh, within his own consumption. Uh, if you if you happen to be at work or at your home and you find half empty bottles or half full bottles, uh, that is a sure sign that somebody in the house is drinking and hiding them. When I say you find them, you might find them in cushions, you might find them in the closet, you might find them under the bed. A lot of men. Uh, probably women too, hide alcohol in kitchen cabinets behind cans. That's another sign. Secret drinking. Now what is secret drinking? Not all these that I'm going over are directly from the Mayo Clinic. It's their definitions. Uh, I might go past their wording a little quickly, so uh, bear with me. Drinking alone or before or after going out. That's secret drinking. They don't want somebody to know. They want to get their high before going out, and certainly when they come back after going out, because between the before and the after was that sobriety uh, area. In other words, they, they weren't drinking in front of people because they don't want people to know that they're drinking. So it's before and after. Talk about getting ready to go out, which involves heavy drinking before going to an event. What they're doing is that um, they know they're going out, so they're, they're just dumping all the alcohol into their system uh, to get them through whatever event. It might be a hockey game, it might be an opera, whatever. That's what they do. As alcohol use increases regularly, a person needs more to get the same effect. We were just talking about that, my wife and I, because I read this today uh, on the website of the Mayo Clinic, and, and I can relate to what I read because when I used to start off, I used to have two, three, or four shots of vodka. Suddenly I needed five. Towards the end, before I hit rock bottom, I was doing 10 shots of vodka in a walk sometimes to the store, uh, or just cutting the grass in the back. And if anybody knows about shots, they're very small and 10 of them you can do really quick. And if your immune system 
or your dependency is 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 that strong, ten shots is very easily uh, uh, consumable. And and I was doing it, believe me. Uh, so let's get back. So the secret alcoholic alcoholic often before or after going to events involving alcohol to be at the same levels as his friends. What does that mean? What he needs to do is drink a lot of alcohol before going to the event because when he's going out with his friends he doesn't want to appear as an alcoholic so he wants to drink equal to what they're drinking whether it's one or two so he has to have maybe 10 shots before going out and then when he gets home he fills himself up again uh, hiding this is a subject that I don't even need to look up to, to talk about because I was very good at it let me just tell you folks something when I hit rock bottom on June 22nd 2013 I went into my shed and dragged out a garbage can to show my wife what was in that garbage can and folks when I dumped it onto the lawn and my wife saw that if I tell you there were and this is no lie over a hundred shots of empty vodka bottles what I was doing was drinking them out in the backyard drinking them walking and hiding in my pocket to hide them into the shed uh, drinking possibly in the house, putting them in my pants pocket to hide them in the shed again. That was what I was doing. So hiding the evidence is what I want to call because the evidence is, is, is the alcohol consumption. What closet drinkers do is they hide their bottles. We're going to go over where common places of hiding could be. It could be in the garbage cans. What they'll do is drink it, go outside, lift a bag of garbage up, throw the empties, and put the bag down. It could be in kitchen cabinets, like I said, usually behind tall cans. It could be uh, hidden uh, in, in clothes bags. It could be hidden between the layers of clothes. It could be in recycling bins. These are all areas that alcoholics, such as myself, where I used to do this, would hide things because you don't want your loved one, you don't want your children to see what you're really consuming. So this is what they do, this is what I used to do, this is not what I do anymore. Vodka becoming a preferred drink is another sign of a closet drinker. Vodka, for me, it definitely was. There are reasons why. Now let me read you what the Mayo Clinic is saying, then I'm going to tell you what my reason is. Vodka is often the preferred choice of secret alcoholics because it is colorless, fairly odorless, and so it can be added to many beverages, including Coke, gin, whatever, iced tea, it could be added to it. Generally, the only way to determine if vodka has been added to a beverage is, is to taste it. Now, how many people do you go out with to an event like baseball, basketball, hockey, and you're going to say, let me have a sip of your iced tea so I can see what you're consuming in there. Nobody does that. So this is why alcoholics especially secret alcoholics, they want to hide what they have in their uh, uh, drink, such as Coke or something, so that's what they do. Also, look for vodka on store receipts, so when you get your credit card bills, uh, husbands and wives, and possibly you're suspecting that your, your uh, spouse uh, are drinking uh, excessively, when you get the statements, look for liquor shops, look for things as such on there. You will find things uh, like that, I can guarantee you. Uh, when I used to use our debit card, I was so afraid to use it at a liquor shop because I do know uh, when the paper statement or the online statement would come, it would show liquor shop and that's a red flag. So of course, you don't want to do that. Uh, so let me go back to reading it. Also look for the vodka on store receipts or someone switching to vodka as they preferred alcohol choice. So suddenly, your husband's always been drinking beer, your wife has always been drinking wine, and suddenly they're starting to consume a lot more, uh, but the a lot more is vodka. That's a sure sign of a secret closet drinker. Let's go right to the next one. Missing being late for important events or having unexpected absences. They're not showing to work on time. They're calling in sick a, a, a lot. They're sleeping late. Those are sure signs of a closet drinker because what they're doing is they're drinking a lot uh, during the day, uh, excuse me, during the night, and they just can't get up during the day. 
and, and that sure is a sign, so uh, we need to be careful. Now, let me read what the Mayo Clinic is saying, because this was my explanation, and sometimes I don't explain things too well, so let me read it. Increasingly, the person misses or is late for important appointments, work, school, family events. The secret alcoholic may disappear for periods of time. Suddenly, where's my husband? Where's my wife? Or may claim to be somewhere they're not. Where were you, honey? Oh, I went and stopped and spoke to a friend. Oh, that's funny because someone, a friend of mine, just told me they saw you coming out of a bar. That is a secret alcoholic because why can't your husband and wife just say, I went to the bar? Because they don't want you to know that they're consuming all this excessive alcohol. Next one is making excuses to drink. Now, what does that mean? Making excuses to drink. Let's give the Mayo Clinic version. Frequently stating that actually following through on, I need a drink. Honey, can you go cut the grass? First, I need a drink. Can you paint the bedroom? I need a drink. Those are excuses. Those are uh, excuses to have a drink. They feel they need to be rewarded to do a chore around the house, and their reward is a drink. Let me continue. They will also become defensive when someone discusses their drinking or will give their reasons for drinking with a little prompting. Honey, why are you drinking so much? It's all the stress at work. It's the mortgage payment. Those are excuses. Those are excuses that people will use uh, to justify their drinking habits. Next, drinking in appropriate times. Wake up in the morning, you're downstairs in the kitchen getting your coffee ready and suddenly you see your husband just walking downstairs, going to the freezer, taking out the bottle of vodka and walking away with it, not pouring it in front of you, not doing anything like that. So uh, that is a, a sure sign and you need to be careful about that. So uh, inappropriate times of drinking is a sure sign of A, a closet drinker and B, an alcoholic. Next one. Increased isolation, loss of interest. As alcohol becomes more of a focus for an alcoholic, they tend to ignore other areas of their life. They may avoid people in order to hide their drinking, refusing to admit anything. They don't want to go to your parents' house and visit with you on a Sunday. They'd rather be home drinking. If you're gone from the house, they have uh, all the alone time at home to, to drink. And to be quite honest with you, an alcoholic, a closet, excuse me, I have something in my eye. A closet alcoholic uh, being left at home alone while you're out to your mother's or shopping is like a kid in a candy store. I b believe you me, I used to love when my wife was leaving because to me, that was a green light. Let the party and start. I didn't have to hide it. I could walk around the house with the shots in my hand, and uh, it was totally different. And, and these are the signs. Let's go right to the third page. Mayo Clinic meeting first. Frequent mood swings. Big sign. With me, it was constantly. I would uh, be happy one minute, be sad the next minute, be angry the next minute. Those are frequent mood signs. Let's go with the Mayo Clinic explanation. Alcohol use and withdrawal affects excuse me, a person's mood and thinking. Sudden outburst, intense rage, depression, sadness are common. All these different personalities, the depression. Why are you depressed? Well, I can tell you why he's depressed or she's depressed. It's because they're not getting enough alcohol. As soon as the alcohol gets into their blood, what happens? They get a sense of humor. They get giddy. They open up, as my I think my wife used to call me a chatting Kathy. That's what happens. So the mood swings and the depression and all that is there during sobriety or soberness, I should say, because sobriety they're not, uh, is during their soberness. And as soon as they get their fix, their drinks, personalities change, moods change, all that changes. Memory loss and blackouts. Now we discussed that briefly before, but. There were many a times where I would wake up the next morning after drinking the night before and not know anything, not remember anything. Didn't hear my wife coming home from work. Didn't even know how I made it to bed. Didn't didn't know, uh, did I lock the back door? Those are considered memory losses, probably due to blackouts. Guaranteed. 
What is their explanation? Did, uh, they're saying forgetting certain events or facts or completely failing to remember portions of time. That's pretty much what I just explained. That's directly from the Mayo Clinic. Again, another thing from the Mayo Clinic is over-focused on alcohol. What they're doing is they're constantly focusing on alcohol. Let's read what they say. Instead of focusing on who will be at an event or what it is, in other words, what is the event? Is it a hockey game? Instead of focusing on that, the secret alcohol will often dwell on what and when they can drink. When we get to the to the hockey game, can I run to the bathroom, take a shot out of my pocket and take the shot? What time are we leaving so we can get home? What time are we leaving? Do I still have five minutes? These are signs because what they're doing is buying time, buying space and buying areas to do their secret closet drinking. Drinking quickly or chugging, big sure sign for me. You have to get rid of the evidence. If I'm walking down the street, my shots of vodka are in my pocket, and I'm looking around, and I, I'm i worried about our neighbor's going to see what I used to do, and this is no lie, I put the shot in here, and now a shot is about this tall, and just pretend like I was scratching myself or whatever. Just chuck it down, back into my pocket. Drinking quickly or chugging, it's the best way to be a closet drinker and is most effective. I don't recommend anyone doing it, but I'm telling you, I know the signs, I've been there, I've done it. Drinking rituals. Mayo Clinic's meeting is always drinking at certain times immediately when getting home from work, absolutely, sometimes even before going to work, always before dinner. Why is that? Because what they don't want to do is eat the dinner and fill themselves up not to fit their alcohol. Because their alcohol is more important than dinner. Sometimes it's more important than paying bills. Sometimes it's more important than putting food on the table for your own children and your wife. If you're truly an alcoholic, you are going to always put your alcohol as the number one priority in your life. Believe me. I know. Let's get back to it. The mark of a secret alcoholic is that they need to keep their ritual drinking at all times. They become upset or cannot cope when a ritual is disrupted. Remember yesterday or the day before we talked about a, a sure sign of, of a start in recovery is if you're used to drinking at four every day, change it to the next day to five during your steps towards sobriety. Change it to six. Get away from old habits. Old habits are, are habits you need to get away from because those habits are the reason you are where you are now. Missing items from home. If you're starting to miss money, jewelry, or things, anything like that, a sure sign is, is that if you're already suspecting that your husband or your wife or your children are, are closet alcoholics, if things are missing suddenly, it's a sure sign that they're running out of money and they're taking it and either selling it on the street or going to a poor and shop. So those are signs that you, uh, that you need to pay attention. Now, let me read what the Mayo Clinic says about that. Addictions end up being expensive. We all know that. Whether it's drugs or alcohol, drugs so much more. Sometimes in order to hide the amount of money being spent on alcohol because husbands and wives, they usually know how much they each have. They know what's in the bank. So what do they do? They go and steal. The secret alcoholic will take money or uh, expensive items from home. They will pawn it, they will sell it to get their alcohol, to get their drugs. So that's important. I'm going to finish the last paragraph from the Mayo Clinic and in closing of The Closet Drinker, and then I'll do a recap on it, and then we'll discuss a couple other things. No single item or even a set or even several of them indicate a secret alcoholic for a certain. In other words, anything on what I just talked about doesn't mean that they're a secret alcoholic, but these are signs that they might be. However, these are common signs that some someone may have preoccupation with or over reliance on alcohol. So in other words, these are signs that they might be a secret alcoholic. Alcoholism is a disease that does not go away. However, it can be treated, however, it can be worked with and lived with, like I've explained over and over again on all my videos. If you suspect someone or you love that may have a problem with alcohol, look for ways to get help. We discussed that yesterday. 
There are many ways to get help. Go back to my uh, previous day video and, and you can certainly find the ways to get help. There are many resources for family members affected by alcohol, such as AA, treatment centers, rehab centers, my methods. There are many ways, and we're going to get into that one, one second. Let me just recap on the Mayo Clinic findings on closet alcoholics. Warning signs are... I'm going to go through them briefly. I don't need to go through them all. Secret drinking, hiding, vodka becoming preferred drink. If you start seeing your husband, wife, or son or daughter, or grandparents, whatever, start to drink a lot more vodka. That's a sure sign. Missing or being late for work, home, wherever. When they used to be punctual, suddenly their their attendance is, is, is kind of lacking. That's another sign. Making excuses to drink. Why are you drinking again? Well, because I need to, because we have financial issues. My job is stressful. Uh, the lawn's getting too long. Whatever the excuses might be. Drinking in inappropriate times. Are they starting to drink right before bed? Are they starting to drink first thing in the morning? Warning signs. Increased isolation, loss of interest in going out, going to functions. If they start doing all those things and showing those signs, that's a sure sign also. Frequent mood swings, absolutely. We talked about that many times before, but if your husband, wife, or whoever you suspect is being a closet drinker starts changing their personalities a lot, that is a sure sign. Physical symptoms, trembling hands, flushed face, red or blotchy skin. We've talked about this. Let me tell you folks, at one time in my life, I was getting so bad that when I was writing, my hand was shaking, literally like this. I know in the camera it's kind of hard to, to show, but, and, and my wife pointed it out and I would just come up with any excuse to justify why my hand was shaking, but sure sign. Uh, memory loss and blackouts, we talked about that. I've had them. I'm sure if you're watching me and, and, and you are either a closet drinker or an excessive drinker, You've had them too. They're not fun. Wonderful thing about sobriety is that you don't have to worry about these things anymore. Drinking quickly or chugging it down. Remember I used to walk down the street, I'd keep it in my hand, nobody would see it, and just pretend like I'm scratching and chug a, a shot down like it was nothing. I would go from one end of my block to the other and I already had five shots. They wouldn't affect me right away, but that kick would come in about a half an hour and boy, get in this start. Mood swings start. Personalities change. Everything changes with alcohol. Everything changes with sobriety, but for the better. Missing things at home. You go and you say, honey, I have to, I ask you to cut the grass today. Well, we don't have a lawnmower. Well, where is it? What do you think it might be? He might have pawned it. She might have pawned it. So those are sure signs of closet drinkers. And I hope this particular seg segment about closet drinking helped you understand what is a closet drinker. What are the signs for closet drinking? Why do people drink secretly? Those are all things that are on this video that we just discussed. I can give you a copy of uh, all my findings. What you have to do is just uh, get back to me. Let's go over the contact information. Uh, my email address is ralph.friedrichs at yahoo.com. That's R-A-L-F dot f-r-i-e-d-r-i-c-h-s at yahoo.com you can go on my website www.clearviews.info that's c-l-e-a-r-v-i-e-w-s dot i-n-f-o you can call me on my business phone 844-393-9355 and you can go on facebook also and uh, go on clearviews.info uh, my cell phone number is 631-599-0218 if you want any copy of whether it's the DVD itself or this video or the brochures that I took from the Mayo Clinic from online, call me, email me, do whatever you need to do to contact me. I'd be more than happy to forward a copy to you free of charge. Now, let's talk about my website real quick. On my website, I have all my videos. And believe me, there's I think I'm up to 25 or 26 videos now. They range anywhere from... Uh, eight minutes which was my first one which was the worst video you've probably ever seen before in your life like I always say it was a train wreck to my last video which was yesterday so they extend from eight minutes to about 40 minutes uh, somewhere in between each uh, the average one is about 30 minutes on there you see all my videos you also see plenty of articles plenty of newspaper clippings and videos by other sources the other sources are from doctors 
psychiatrists and psychologists, they are the ones that really dispense all the medical advice and opinions on my website. All I do is take their stuff and put on my website for you to read, for you to view. That's all I do. My own personal videos are my testifying. It's my life experience, it's my research, it's all that uh, that I have been doing. So that's on my website. Now, let's talk about different methods. We've discussed this before and we're gonna discuss it right now really quickly again. There are three methods that we always talk about. You have my method of recovery and my method is basically is knowledge. I feed myself with knowledge and what I do with my knowledge that I feed myself is I give it to you. How do I feed my knowledge? I have my website that I refresh daily. I work on it. I put new things on it, take old things off and I give that information for you to view each and every day. I do the videotapes that continuously refreshes my memory of what I need to do to, to continue in sobriety. That is important also. Now we have AA. AA is a huge organization with plenty of people that have gone through it that are in it right now. That's another uh, avenue for you to, to continue, continuously uh, utilize them for recovery. They have the 12-step program. Mind you, I've said this once and uh, let me just bring it up in this video. I came up with 16 alternative steps to their 12-step program. The difference between their 12 steps and my 12 steps is that they both pretty much do the same thing except for I have the extra four. But what I do is I take that textbook reading that they have, the wording and the reading, and I make it more understandable in the layman's term uh, for, for people like you and me to understand it and to, to want to do it uh, in, in, in a quicker fashion. When I say quicker, in other words, you'll jump on it because you understand it and you don't have to sit there and analyze each and every word that's on there. So you have my methods, you have AA, and then of course you have, for the people that are a little weaker, when I say weaker, not in strength, but in mind, if you feel that you cannot be left at home alone, uh, that you might start drinking, uh, you might want to check yourself into a rehab center. Re rehab centers have the 30, 60, 90 day programs. If you go to page seven on my website, click on the state that you live in, and then click on the area that might be close to you. Now, on my website, when you click on the state and you don't see uh, your town under that state, go to your internet, go to the search bar, type in uh, Google, go to Google, type in treatment centers with your area and you'll find an area right nearby to, uh, by you. So those are the, pretty much the three methods, but I always say this, it's very important. All three methods will work 100% better if you include God. Remember, one of the 12 steps um, um, in AA is to, to seek your higher power. My higher power is my and your God. It is God who created us in his own way. He created us to be perfect. Now, when we kind of go off the, uh, the, the, the track of being perfect and we kind of fall into addictions and we fall into whatever mis mischief that we fall into, it, it's God that sits on the sideline and waits. He waits for you to finally say, I've had enough. I can't run my life alone. I need you, God, to direct and guide me. And he'll stand there and wait for you. And all you have to do is tell God you made a mistake, ask God for forgiveness, and God will accept you back. And then God will uh, send you on a whole different path again, the path that he originally started off with when you were born, which is a perfect human, and God will direct you to become that again. So include God in whatever you do, whether it's uh, addiction recovery, it's anything you do in life, you need to include God in there. So now we have the three methods, we're including God, and then of course we have the smaller branches like the Lions Club, the YMCA, and they all have programs too, uh, like your church, and that's where God comes in hand. So we have those meth methods, we, have, we know what we need to do, we know what a closet drinker now is, and uh, uh, if you are a closet drinker and you're watching this, by all means, look at some of my videotapes. There is a better life out there for you. Sobriety is nothing but pure joy. But what you need to do is you need to make that first step. And it's not an easy step, I'll tell you. I relapsed six, seven times. I really did. 
It is not an easy step. If you relapse, do me a favor. Dust your knees, pick yourself up. By all means, do not go back to the old drug abuse or alcohol abuse. Whichever one that you do, you might be doing both. Don't go back to doing that. It's counterproductive to do that. All you need to do is start all over. So if you're a month into it and you suddenly have a relapse, it's not the end of the world. It's a setback. That's all it is. You start again, you count again. Let me just give a shout out to my friend up north. Uh, today is Friday. It's 2 in the morning on a Friday. I know tomorrow it's one month anniversary. I want to congratulate you for your one month anniversary. And it's such a joy to reach that plateau. And, and I hope and pray you continuously continue uh, being sober. I always warn you about working so much. Slow down, take a self inventory, step back, and um, do your eight to 10 hour shifts. But uh, if you work too much, you might fall into the distress, and the stress is a signal. Do you remember we talked about stresses last week in one of my video stressors? One of the stressors is uh, overworking yourself. So, congratulations on your one month anniversary. My friend uh, with the grandchild that has an issue, uh, I hope to God that video that I did yesterday about how to uh, work with a family member that's addicted, I hope that video was uh, productive for you. I didn't hear from you yesterday, so uh, I will attempt to text you today. Um, it's so important that whatever you saw in that video that you practice that because it's, I think it's really come down to that you need to do an intervention. You are the head of the household, do the intervention. Um, just to update everyone on my studies, I spoke to the director of the education department and uh, it looks like I'm ready to go soon and I'm going to uh, start, uh, I haven't decided which one of the two I'm deciding on. It's either going to be a substance abuse counselor or it's going to be a recovery uh, a coach, uh, an addiction recovery coach. Both are certifications. Uh, one is a little bit more detailed and a lot longer. Uh, the other one is more of a motivational type of job. Uh, it, it, the requirement on that one is a lot more of what I do right now and what I uh, really might want to do and that is to motivate people that are either going into some kind of treatment center or coming out of a treatment center or coming out of a, a DWI jail sentence. A recovery, addiction recovery coach is, is, is a really good job. A substance abuse counsel also is a very good job. Uh, so I'm kind of weighing either one. Uh, if you're watching this video and you're on Facebook, private message me and tell me what you think I should do. Um, you know, I had my mind set on the substance abuse counselor, but I, I tell you, after reading up yesterday, on the addiction recovery coach, it, it, I'm kind of leaning that way because I, I just feel that I would probably serve better at that uh, than than a substance abuse counselor. So if you are watching and you see this, do me a favor, private message me on Facebook and let me know what you think I should do. Your opinion counts. As much as your opinion counted on picking a cover for my DVD, uh, I did pick one out. Um, I'm going to post it tomorrow on Facebook. And uh, if you want a copy of any one of my videos, I can fit three videos on each DVD. Uh, private message me, call me, text me. I'd be more than happy to get one over to you, and there's no charge for that. Um, it's in hopes that why you're taking that is because you want to maybe watch it yourself over and over again, or possibly forward it to someone in your family or a loved one or a co-worker that you know has an addiction issue and that needs help. Because that's the purpose of this. I don't want to just sit in front of a camera and look at myself and talk for 30, 40, 50 minutes. No. My, my uh, goal here to do this is just to save one person in my audience at a time. Just one. I would love to say save everybody, but I realistically know that 1% is maybe doable. 10% is asking way too much, 100% forget about it. But 1%, if I can do that, I feel like mission accomplished. My goal is to help as many people as I can. 
My goal is to make people see what sobriety is really about and how you can get a well-balanced life with sobriety. A well-balanced life comes with sobriety. Your life, if you're drinking and doing drugs, I guarantee you, your life is out of control. You might put up a good front in front of people. You might be able to fool people, but it's, a, it's a, a, an unbalanced life. It's not good for your health and it's not fair to your loved ones. So do me a favor. Think about saying today is my last day. Let today, a sober today, become a better tomorrow for you. Because I will tell you, and I tell this every time in my videos, if you believe it here, because it's all right here, this is where your strength lies in your brain. If you believe it here, you can achieve it there at home. You can achieve it there at work. Sobriety becomes easier as the months go by. Yes, the first week or two are terrible. You're going to have the shakes. You're going to have the dry heaves. But the end of the journey, or the, the, during the journey, becomes easier. But the end of the journey, when you have maybe a year under your belt of pure sobriety, not one relapse in that one year, not one ounce of alcohol, not one joint, no nothing, that is an accomplishment that you'll be so proud of. It's even better than graduating from school or anything because when you have a disease, and you are working with that disease and you're working with it every day and you're feeling better, that is a huge accomplishment. It's like having cancer and you're going through chemo and that chemo is helping your cancer and it's keeping you alive longer. And every time you go for that chemo, it's, it's extending your life. Well, that's what sobriety is. If you're an alcoholic or you're on drugs, each time, each day that you don't drink and you don't smoke, is like chemo, you're extending your life. And if you continuously do that, God willing, you will have a long life. So we can concentrate on doing that, but folks, you need to take that first step. And I hope that each and every video I do has a huge impact, like I hope this particular video has a very huge impact on you. Closet drinking and secret uh, drinking, and the same goes with drugs. I'm just utilizing closet drinking as the subject here, but if you want to substitute the drinking with drugs, there is closet drug uh, consuming people out there. I guarantee you that. So I hope that this video has more of an impact than, than anything right now that you can imagine because it's these videos that I hope that you will find pure happiness, pure sobriety, and a longer life. And that's all I really want from you. So enough of that. In recap, we talked about closet drinking and secret drinking. We talked about the signs. The signs are secret drinking. They do it behind everybody's back. They're hiding the evidence. They're hiding empty bottles. They're hiding whatever uh, caps. They're hiding uh, in between pillows. They're hiding in garbage cans. They're hiding in laundry baskets. They're hiding their empties everywhere. That is a sure sign. Vodka is becoming their preferred drink. When that, when people start doing vodka exclusively, that's a sure sign that there is a major issue going on, and uh, that's a, that's a sure sign that we need to pay attention to. Missing or being late for work and, and coming home late and things like that. You've always been punctual. Now you're starting to see your spouse or your loved one doing uh, coming home late or going to work late or whatever. The punctuality has changed. Those are sure signs. Making excuses to drink. Well, I need to drink because I'm stressed. Let me tell you folks, in, although I've been sober now for a year and almost two months now, I still have stress. But in a year and two months, as time goes on, I don't care how much stress you throw at me, it doesn't matter because alcohol is not the answer. You'll know that when you have hit sobriety for a while, that alcohol is not the answer and you can get past stress with just common sense thinking. That's all you need. Stress management, if you can do that, that is great. Stress management, management does not require alcohol, nor should you have alcohol to deal with stress. So that's a sure sign. Um, drinking in inappropriate times, Drinking in the morning. I used to drink at any time. It didn't matter. It's like in college you eat pizza for breakfast. Uh, 
drinking at four in the morning didn't matter to me. So if you start seeing your loved one drinking at inappropriate times, that's a sure sign. Increased isolation, loss of interest in going out, going shopping. They just want to lay around, take naps like I used to do, just take a nap in the middle of the afternoon. You know, oh, I'm tired because I couldn't sleep last night, I would say. Whatever excuse I would come up with, sure sign. Uh, mood swings, big sign again. If you start seeing your loved ones constantly with the mood swings and uh, and you see some of the other signs, because I, you know it's kind of hard to say one sign is going to make that person a closet drinker. But if you start seeing a few of these signs, gap them together, throw them into the mix, and you might uh, come out with a closet drinker. You might see that you have a loved one uh, that has uh, issues. Um, memory loss and blackouts, big time for me. Wouldn't even know where we were, how we got there, whatever. And that, that's dangerous, especially if you're driving a car and you start having blackouts. God forbid you kill yourself, but more importantly, and I hate to put it this way, but you might be out there killing other people. A car becomes a weapon. It's like a loaded gun if you're driving drunk or if you're driving on drugs. You're driving a loaded weapon. And if you use that to kill somebody, God forbid, how would you live with yourself? Another one, uh, over-focus on alcohol. Let me read to you what the Mayo Clinic says about that because uh, that's important. Over-focus on alcohol. Instead of focusing on who will be at the event or where it is, the secret alcohol will often dwell on how am I going to get my fix. Who cares where they're going? That's what they're saying. I just want to know when am I going to get home so I can drink? What time are we leaving so I can drink? That is what they're focused on. Drinking rituals. If you notice that a person drinks every day at four o'clock that is a sure sign let me tell you you remember we spoke about this in one of the previous videos about how to become sober and i said if you drink at four every day as you wean yourself off from from drinking drink at five one day drink at two the other day get out of the old habits old habits give you old results new habits give you new results better results Missing items at home, you're starting to see jewelry disappearing. We spoke about, and this was just a joke about the lawnmower. The lawnmower is gone. Sure sign, anything that's worth money, they will cash in. They'll pawn it, sell it to get their uh, fix. And why? You guys might have the money at home, but wouldn't that be a red flag if you're the wife and suddenly you start seeing a lot of money disappearing? And you ask your husband, and what's he supposed to say? Oh, I'm using it for drinking? Of course not. Who's going to admit to that? So what he is doing is he's taking or she's taking from home, selling it to get their fix. So that is the recap. I hope to God that this was a good segment for you, that you got a lot out of this. Remember the methods. You have my method, which is educating yourself daily. It really does work. When you go to AA, AA will tell you the 12 steps. I have the 16 alternative steps, so you have a choice there. I also will tell you that uh, I'm not sure what AA really does as far as, because I only went to a couple of their meetings, but I'm not sure as far as the educating yourself, but it's really, really, truly important, and I'm going to tell you again, is every day you need to take a half an hour time out for yourself, and during that time out, I need you folks to educate yourself. Read about addictions, read about the signs, read about recovery, read about sobriety, watch videos. I have plenty on my website, www.clearviews.info, has plenty of videos. If you're really severe enough, go into a rehab center, do the 30, 60, 90 day programs. Folks, if you're out there right now, it's 2 o'clock in the morning here or 2.30 now in the Hamptons, Long Island. If you're out there, you just came home. And, and you had a really bad night with drink, drinking or drugging, and you're looking at my video and you can barely see the screen, uh, your chest is pounding, your head is pounding, um, the, possibly you're drooling, um, God knows what else, call 911. Do yourself a favor, and I'm not even kidding about this. It's better to call 911 to go to the hospital even for them to say there's nothing wrong with you then to take that chance that there might be something wrong and you didn't call so do that when you come back home continue watching this video that's that's perfectly fine but the doctors are there for a reason and that's to make sure that you live longer so those are the things that we um, have to really watch out for 
Uh, I'm up to 44 minutes already, so I'm going to cut this now. And uh, I hope to God that I get to do another video. I have, uh, we have our grandchildren coming in about five hours. I was going to do this video in the morning. Uh, for me to do this video, I really can't have anyone around me because I get distracted. Uh, just so you guys understand how I really do this, what I do is I set up a laptop. And then what I do is I take my papers that I really write up from studies. Uh, in this case, it was the Mayo Clinic, and I tape them around my laptop, almost like a like a U shape. So as I'm talking to you, I get to read that. And uh, but today's topic was really uh, uh, an easy one for me because I was a closet drinker. I was a secret drinker. Everybody knew I was drinking, but I still was because I was drinking a lot more than what people knew. So that's what I do. That's that's how I do this. So I need to be alone. I can't have my grandchildren around. I can't have my wife around. And uh, so I'm uh, here in the bedroom because you guys always see the background uh, being the living room. And today I'm in the bedroom because my wife is in the living room right now. So um, thank you so much for stopping by. I hope I get to do another video soon. Hope preferably tonight. Uh, excuse me, not tonight. That'd be crazy. Uh, this weekend sometime. And uh, I'm going to attempt to go and get a couple hours of sleep. Um, I cannot wait to, to do my next video. I haven't decided on what topic yet. Uh, if uh, you're watching this and there are any topics that you'd like me to discuss on a video, private message me or text me. I'd be more than happy to do the research on it. Also, don't forget to private message me or text me what you think I should do. Should I be a substance abuse counselor, go to school for that, or be an addiction recovery coach? which I'm kind of leaning to. So I need everybody's input and I, I really depend on people's advisement. Um, I kind of told my wife about the addiction recovery coach last night and because uh, we've been talking about the addiction, excuse me, substance abuse counselor. So uh, I'm kind of like on a, on a, I don't know what you want to call it. I'm kind of just sitting there and deciding which I should do. So uh, I depend on your input. So let's cut this right now, but I just want to say this. A sober today makes for a better tomorrow. Let today be the first day for the rest of your life. Let it be the best day. Because if you become sober today, your life from this point on will become better. Even if you have a relapse or two. You pick yourself up. You dust your knees. Don't go back to the old abuse again. Just start again. That's all you have to do. It took me six, seven times, folks. So you can do it, okay? That's all you need to do. Sober today makes for a better tomorrow. Just believe it here to achieve it there. That's all you have to do, folks. And I really hope to see you real soon again. Uh, I will post this first thing in the morning onto Facebook. So hopefully Friday afternoon, uh, Friday lunchtime, Friday afternoon, you folks get to see this. And uh, if you have any recommendations whatsoever, let me know. Oh, really quick. For the folks that I've been speaking to in my other videos, I, uh, we spoke about action plans. If you are deciding after this video you want to become sober, you want to seek sobriety, please come up with an action plan. If you want me to see the action plan, private message me or text me with, a, with an action plan. What is an action plan? An action plan is pretty simple. It's how you want to go through seeking uh, sobriety. What is your recovery plan? Is it my methods? Is it AA? Is it the rehab center? Or is it all three? And don't forget in your action plan, include God. He needs to be part of that because without your higher power, my God and your God, there is nothing else that's going to work. Let him guide you, whether it's in sobriety or in your daily life. He is your God that created you, let him be part of your life. Don't exclude him. Because when you exclude God, you're, you're going against everything that uh, he has wanted from you. And, and we can't do that. For too many years, I didn't include God in my life. Um, I will tell you this, I'm not a very religious person, but I do believe that God needs to be part of your life. I do believe that we as humans need to go through our lives and lead the best to our ability. Do not commit crimes, do not lie, do not steal. The Ten Commandments is, is super important, but I do believe that I lead a life to the best of my ability. Sure, I can do a lot better under different circumstances. Uh, 
you know, maybe give money to charities and all, but my circumstances only allow so much and so are your circumstances. But for what, what you have, if you work with it and include God, it will blossom into so much more, okay? So have a good morning or a good night, depending on where you are. I know my friend up north, he's uh, having a good night right now and a sober night, I hope. And I will talk to everybody real good. Sober today makes a better tomorrow. And if you believe it here, you'll achieve it there. Have a great night and a sober day and a sober weekend. Take care and God bless you.